BlackBerry, anyone remember it, has released the Passport with a large square 4.5 inch screen and a full physical QWERTY keyboard below. The display resolution is an odd 1440 by 1440 pixels with BlackBerry saying businesses will be able to fit more content in. It's an interesting idea but the overall device does look a bit cumbersome. The keyboard keys are also touch sensitive enabling swipes and brushes to interact with the OS. As you might guess from the current price of a whopping £530 in the UK, inside it's pretty highly specified. The Passport has a 2.2 GHz Snapdragon processor with 3 GB of RAM and 32 GB of internal storage plus microSD and a 13 megapixel camera with OIS and a 3450 mAh battery. Wow. There's the brand new BlackBerry OS 10.3 with the Amazon App Store for Android applications all integrated plus BlackBerry Assistant similar to Siri, Google Now and Cortana. A nice slice of lateral thinking overall and I'm in the queue to review it hopefully but if this thing is a mainstream success then I'll eat my hat. Well, this is a first. Two reviews for the price of one. Oh, uh, wait, you're not paying for this one. Oh, well, there's always the donation of a virtual pint of beer. See the link. Anyway, as you probably guessed, this is the new Sony pairing, the top two smartphones in its lineup with similar specs and yet different form factors the Xperia Z3 and the Z3 Compact. Yes, it's only been six months since the Z2, and Sony is clearly pushing out fast incremental updates, but they're having an effect. The Z3 and its compact are most definitely the best in the series yet. They're not perfect, quite, but they're very close. The two are pretty much identical in terms of internals too. A 2.5 gigahertz processor each with a three gig around here and two gig on the compact and a light Android skin, meaning that the two devices both fly whatever you're doing, it's just quick, quick, quick. The displays are both very good. We're talking IPS LCD here with software enhancements like X Reality, but the end product is that clarity and colors are excellent indoors. Outdoors, they can't quite match Nokia's patented CBD polarizers, but the screens are still readable most of the time. The most noticeable change from the Z2 is that everything's now rounded, continuing the refinement since the original Z slab. Now the curved metal edges here on the Z3 and the curved plastic on the compact on top of a metal frame I think plus nylon protectors on all four corners not only feel good in the hand gosh am I really saying that about Sony's head devices but they're going to come off well if the phone is dropped which is normally on a corner well done Sony also well done for providing the choice of sizes some will prefer the larger 5.2 inch 1080p screen version with larger bezels to match perhaps for watching media and clearer web browsing Others will want to go for the smaller 4.6 inch 720p screen compact, which has much smaller bezels and is a genuine phone sized phone, yet with top notch internal specs. Both phones have 16 gigabyte internal disks, of which about 11 gig is available out of the box, plus micro SD. This latter is inserted via one of several waterproof flaps on each device, now even sleeker and in theory waterproof. Though am I the only person to be a little paranoid and not want to put the 30 minute immersion claim to the test on such a valuable device? But it's good to know that a brief dunk or a shower will be absolutely no problem. The glossy bodies are both fingerprint magnets, of course, to some extent, but less so than for previous models. So there does seem to be some Sony oleophobic coating magic here. There are lanyard eyelets towards the bottom of uh, both devices, though actually feeding a lanyard loop through is a bit fiddly. Both devices feature front-mounted stereo speakers. They're decently loud, but not quite up the quality of HDC's best. There's a bit of deep purple for you, Mr. Steve Morse. I know, I know. Haraku's better than Richie, though. <laughs> not bad, not bad. I still wonder whether the waterproofing does uh, somehow limit the EQ in the uh, speakers. So, uh, sealed in are the batteries. 3100 milliamp hours here for the Z3 and 2600 for the compact, but battery life has been stellar in my tests. Add in all of Sony's stamina, ultra stamina, data queuing settings, add in the use of Nokia style display memory to preserve content with slower screen refresh rates. And I think you could quite easily get two days of use from either of these Android smartphones, which is quite impressive. Before I get to software, though, I have to comment on one negative, the cameras. Now, don't get me wrong, the original, say, Z1 camera was OK for its time. LED flash and overzealous noise reduction and sharpening notwithstanding. A year or so later, it's obvious that things will have improved, surely? No, 
No, in all my tests, and you can see all about Windows Phone, why I did a head to head with the likes of the 1520 and the 930, the Z3 and Z3 compact camera showed all the flaws that the Z1 original had. It may be a 1 over 2.3 inch sensor with 21 megapixel resolution, but its oversampled 8 megapixel output was consistently bested by the 5 megapixel output from just about every Nokia I have here and by every Samsung. Sony has a problem here and it's completely ignoring it. I know other manufacturers like Apple use Sony's sensors and do much, much more with them. So I'm inclined to blame the Sony engineers in the phone division for underperforming on an epic scale. <laughs> in theory, there's Nokia style oversampling. In practice, there's little evidence. In theory, there's lossless zoom. In practice, it's uncontrollable and rubbish. And all of this could be fixed with better low level sampling algorithms and better camera control. For example, when zooming, very, very disappointing, and yes, both cameras are identical. After the big build-up I just gave them, and especially given Sony's own overarching advertising slogan for these devices, demand great, the camera came as a blow. There's no OIS on board either for more stable video, and the digital stabilization is limited. You can record at 4K, but only in short bursts. Otherwise, the Snapdragon 81 processor overheats. Yes, really. Though this is, in fact, in fairness, in common to all other 801-based devices trying to do the 4K trick. As a pair of Android smartphones, though, the Sony pair are right up with the pack. Nor mobs will struggle a little to get past the immense push of all of Sony's content. The default home screen is all Sony, 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 browsing through the Android app folders. There's Walkman, Movies, PlayStation, Sony Select, Video Unlimited, Play Games and much more. Plus the completely useless Garmin navigation, Xperia Lounge, ABG, Antivirus and so on. That's a lot of bloat if you choose to view it all that way. Maybe a Normod would like it in the Sony universe? Anyone watching this show, however, will simply resolve to hide or install it all and use the Z devices as a pair of fast Android machines, which is what they are. Now, leaving aside camera underperformance, which of these two would I pick? Without question, the Z3 Compact, which fits my hand perfectly, has a larger screen to bezel ratio and offers just about everything the larger phone does in a more pocketable and less obtrusive form factor. To give you an idea, the Compact is the best part of an inch shorter and a third of an inch narrower, yet with a screen that's only just over half an inch shorter in diagonal. If you're not fussed over ultimate camera quality, and if you're prepared to work around the Sony store bloatware, then I can recommend these latest Z series hardware, especially at the compact's price of around £350, all in including taxes. The bigger Z3 is still way over £500 as I record this. The iPhone 6 is here. <laughs> along with the 6 Plus. No, this is a store dummy, but it will come in useful in just a moment. A word on Bendgate. Yes, there's a whole thing whereby I geek applied extreme pressure and bent an iPhone 6 Plus. Maybe there's a slight structural weakness below the volume keys on the iPhone 6 Plus. Maybe. I'm sure even as I say this, Apple's engineers are putting in a fix and extra strengthening and support at the factory. And if your iPhone 6 Plus bends in the meantime, take it to an Apple store, it will get replaced job done. Every, every phone has its teething problems. This is the iPhone 6s. Let's move on. Also here are some of the best cases for the iPhone 6 around sent over by my friends at ProPorter. This is the simply named bumper, slightly bendy, there's that bend word again, and comes in at under £10. Made from a gorgeously grippy and ridged polycarbonate frame with shock absorbent TPU rings all the way around the top and bottom borders. It's just about the most protective case imaginable against drops onto a pavement at least. It's beautifully detailed and my only criticism would be that your thumb's journey onto each edge of the screen is now slightly impeded so it's harder to do full face gestures. Uh, still a cracking buy though. Second is this flip case and stand, and again you can't fault the accuracy of the description but one wonders about the brevity. This is the protective case with hidden card slot. <laughs> it's available in black or this rather unusual light brown in a high grade faux leather. A white version would have been nice too. And it's just under £20, minus the usual offers and discounts. See the ProPorter site for what's available now. Oh, and you get to have it hand inscribed as here for a five or more if you really want. Most of all, this second case is really, really secure, such that getting your iPhone 6 out again is left for someone with stronger fingernails and more patience than me. At least you know the phone's not going to fall out. Uh, two good first party cases then from the folks down on the south coast and with the usual ProPorter lifetime no quibbles replacement warranty.